Cast your mind back to last winter. Hospitals across the country are in panic with record level delays and a record number of patients. Demand for urgent medical attention is already high, with some people waiting more than 24 hours to be admitted to hospital and EDs so full that ambulances are unable to unload patients. A woman who left Middlemore Hospital's emergency department in the early hours of Wednesday morning, after being told it would be hours before she could be seen by a doctor, returned a few hours later critically ill and died in intensive care. A Christchurch GP says the winter illness workload is the worst he's experienced in his 30-year career. Long hours, extra days, staff off sick, themselves sick, uh, it's stressful. And with temperatures dropping, winter illness season is upon us again. Health Minister Aisha Beryl has laid out 24 steps to try to prevent overloaded hospitals and clinics and of course burnt out doctors and nurses. GPs and pharmacies have been given more powers to help ease the pressure on the health system this winter. The government's making paracetamol free for children at pharmacies and virtual health care is being expanded. But will it make a difference? They are all good ideas. I have concern of the ability to have them all up and running effectively for winter. Kia ora, I'm Tom Kitchen, and today on The Detail, COVID, flu, other coughs and colds. Are we bracing for another winter as bad as last year? And will the government's plans to help ease the burden on our overstretched health system actually work? As newsroom political reporter Mark Dolder reminds us, last winter was pretty grim. We actually set a new record for deaths of any cause in the last week of July of last year, where more than 950 people died in a week, including 150 of them of COVID. So that's more than 20 people dying a day from COVID. Mark's reported extensively on the COVID-19 response in the broader health system. Heading into winter, he's taking a close look at what's going on now. We get these numbers of influenza-related hospitalizations each week. Looking at the first week of April, last year there were zero influenza-related hospitalizations, uh, but this year there were 120 influenza-related hospitalizations. And so that tells you, you know, the flu is back this year. Whether it is more or less than last year, we'll only find out when we're in the thick of it. But it'll be of a similar magnitude for sure. So what are we expecting then? It's kind of the same mix that we had last year of those seasonal, you know, non-pandemic illnesses, the influenza. We had probably four times the number of cases of flu that we had seen in prior years when we were under similar settings. And part of that is part in part because we hadn't seen flu for a long time, so it just had so much more opportunity to evade immunity. The RSV. It's not COVID-19, but be vigilant. All the same, it's the RSV virus. It's targeting children and many hospitals are being run off their feet. And then on top of that, COVID is, is still here. You know, our last wave was in December of last year, so we are due for another one. And we know that COVID is more likely to spread during winter, in part because people are indoors and it spreads more easily that way. Um, And so we expect that there will be at least an uptick in in COVID cases over winter, uh, which will put, you know, additional pressure on the the hospital system. Let's take a closer look at those COVID numbers. The seven-day rolling average of cases is about 1,700. And while that might actually sound like a lot, COVID modeler Professor Michael Plank says it's much lower than the numbers we were seeing for most of last year. In terms of how we're tracking with COVID going into winter, it's possible we'll see a wave this winter, but I don't think it's likely to be on the scale of the waves, the big waves that we saw last year. Hospitalizations of people with COVID-19 and case numbers are soaring, pushing our health system already struggling with other winter illnesses to the brink. Although the virus isn't going to go away. We're still going to experience waves. The likelihood is, I think, that those waves are going to be smaller now. And that is because more people are vaccinated. There's a less chance of infection because people already have some immunity from already being infected. Are those some reasons? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the vaccines are really, really good at, at stopping you getting seriously ill. Um, but as we know, they don't entirely prevent uh, transmission, infection and transmission. But the fact that a lot of people have been infected, again, not perfect. You know, we know that people do get reinfected, but it does provide 
um, a high level of immunity across the whole population, that makes it harder for the virus to spread and it really limits the potential for those big waves that we saw last year. What are we seeing in terms of variants? I mean, last year we had a bit of a variant super. It's no longer just one variant like Alpha, Beta, Delta or, or Omicron. It's it's a whole collection of these variants. I mean, it's still a bit of a variant suit. It's um, kind of the year of the recombinants uh, so far. Um, so this is uh, variants that have formed as a result of two different uh, strains recombining and then producing a, a sort of a new sub-variant out of that. People might have heard about um, the XBB variant. The XBB.1.5 variant is out competing other sub-variants overseas and has become a major cause of new infections. So we've got various types of these recombinant variants at the moment, a little bit like the, the variant soup. You know, there's various different types floating around. Um, none of them look drastically different from one another in terms of how much illness they're causing. What we're not seeing is one variant that has a big growth advantage over the other ones, which means it's capable of causing a, a significant wave. That's what happened last winter when the BA5 variant came along. COVID-19 cases are on the rise again, all thanks to the BA.5 variant of Omicron. It was able to spread a lot quicker than the other variants that we had, and that was what caused that wave. At the moment, we've got all these these variants, um, but, yeah, not that different from one another, and there's nothing that stands out as being able to cause a, a major wave at the moment. There's also New Zealand's own homegrown variant, as some people are calling it. It's been responsible for a third of hospital COVID samples in recent weeks. Uh, it hasn't got a fan- fancy title yet. In fact, it's all letters and numbers. It's FK.1.1. Yeah, that's an interesting one. It's, I mean, it's, it's not conclusive because, of course, globally, genome sequencing coverage has, has decreased as, as some of those surveillance programs are wound down. But yes, it, it looks likely that this variant first cropped up uh, in New Zealand. It's spreading. Um, it's within its part of that variant soup. What are we looking at in terms of hospitalizations? I don't think it's likely that it's going to be on the scale of, of last winter. So at the peak of last winter's wave, there are about 850 people being admitted to hospital for, for COVID per week. Hospitalizations have become the key figure to monitor. The latest models show the number of hospitalised patients should peak at about 1,000. At the moment, we're, we're down at more about sort of three to 400. So, you know, much lower level. And we, we might see that track up a little bit during the colder months, but um, I wouldn't expect it to go as high as what we saw last winter. But but of course, the impact on the health system is not just COVID. And so it really depends on how much other respiratory illness there is out there in the community and the timing of those waves as to what the, the sort of overall impact on the health system is going to be. Dr. Emily Harvey is another modeler, and she's been pretty focused on COVID for the last three years. But she's turned her attentions to monitoring other respiratory illnesses through an online survey called Flu Tracking. About 50,000 people each week in New Zealand fill out a survey saying what symptoms they had of respiratory illness in the week before. By looking at that data, we found that's a really great way to get an idea of the general level of respiratory illness in the community. Okay, so what kind of trends have you seen? The data has been really interesting for looking at not just the really severe flu-like illness. So one thing to note is it's called flu tracking, but it's a bit of a misnomer. So really it's tracking respiratory illness symptoms. In 2020 and 2021, we didn't have influenza here or COVID really. And so what it was tracking was some of those other viruses like rhinovirus, um, common cold sort of viruses. And we also saw in that data a really clear spike when RSV got here in 2021 and we had that terrible wave of paediatric hospitalisations. Babies on oxygen and feeding tubes are flooding hospitals as RSV, a potentially deadly respiratory virus, runs rampant across the country. One thing that we see, because the survey has a range of people in different parts of the country and different ages, is we can really clearly see the patterns of illness. We can clearly see in the data when we've got school holidays, all of your respiratory illnesses drop down and then kids come back to school, you see them spike back up again with kids in school mixing. 
Yeah, we just recently had some school holidays. So what kind of trends did we see in that period? In a way, it was really lucky we had school holidays when we did because in that first week of April, we were just starting to see the flu season kick off in New Zealand and also seeing COVID levels increasing in those those younger age groups. And with school holidays for two weeks, it, it acts like a really good circuit breaker in those age groups. And so we've seen hospitalisations for respiratory illness decreasing since that first week of, of April. And it'll be partly school holidays and partly there's all sorts of other things going on, but it definitely helps. What happens during the Northern Hemisphere's flu season is closely watched by health authorities here. The flu strains circulating there are likely to pop up in New Zealand too. The World Health Organisation also monitors flu year-round and makes recommendations about which strains are likely to cause the most illness. But this can only take us so far. It's a really big unknown. We, we can get a bit of a, an idea from looking at what's happened in the Northern Hemisphere winter for the last couple of years, and they've had some bad flu and other respiratory illness uh, seasons. There's no reason why we wouldn't expect a, a bad season here as well. When she announced the winter illness plan earlier this month, Health Minister Aisha Verrill called COVID boosters and flu jams a first line of defence. The latest figures from Te Whatu Ora show more than 800,000 people have got their flu vaccine. The bivalent COVID vaccine became available for some groups on March the 1st and for everyone over 30 at the start of April, though booster rates are still lagging. But beyond vaccines, what else does the government's plan include? Here's Mark Dolda again. It's got 24 different measures in it, and the the gist of it is trying to shift the health burden from hospitals and emergency departments out into primary care and pharmacies where that's possible. And so when you've got a hospital that is struggling with a lot of people who are sick with influenza, with COVID, they don't want to have someone showing up for scans unnecessarily when that could be done at a doctor's office or at a specialist's office or showing up for, for issues that could be sorted by visiting the pharmacy. You know, we see a lot of times people, for example, end up not going to seek treatment at the GP or the pharmacy because it costs so much. Their issue gets bad enough that they then have to go to the emergency department, adding on to that health burden and also meaning actually that they got more sick than they needed to. So what this plan does, it does things like allowing people to go get minor treatment for minor ailments from pharmacies uh, for things like skin conditions and, and, and that sort of thing where Previously, they would have gone to GPs, and then GPs are able to do a whole bunch of things that they haven't been able to do previously, like order radiology services, rather than having to get someone to refer someone to go to the hospital to then get a referral to get a radiology scan. It's kind of, you could say, cutting a bit of red tape that has been in the health sector. And, you know, the overall impact is hopefully that there will be less demand on, on hospitals. One of the highlights, one thing I want to pick you up on there is the pharmacies. This is quite yeah. a new kind of scheme, isn't it? We haven't really seen that before, have we, in pharmacies? Uh, we, we haven't. Uh, and so a, a lot of this is actually picking up from trials that had been conducted uh, around the country and, and kind of nationalising it as an approach. Last year, a pharmacy in Upper Hutt and several in South Auckland piloted this program to allow pharmacists to both treat minor ailments and also help with minor respiratory conditions, where if you've got a young person who's got a bit of a cough rather than having to go to the doctor or to the hospital, they can just go to the pharmacist and get some medicine, some paracetamol or something like that. And so... In Upper Hutt, you know, it was quite effective at at just providing a lot of people with free health treatment and free medicines as well. They waived the the $5 prescription fee for that program. And in South Auckland, the effect was even more significant. It was was credited with reducing the demand that Middlemore Hospital faced at the peak of the sort of winter wave of COVID and influenza because a lot of people who would have gone to hospital normally uh, ended up just going to the pharmacy and getting treatment there. So these trials were pretty successful. They definitely were, and so that's why the government is hoping that they can replicate that success if they're rolled out more widely. And in this case, it's not everywhere in the country that gets this scheme, but it's Northland, Auckland, 
Tauranga, the, the Mid-Central District, Wellington, Christchurch, and Invercargill. So there are about 825 pharmacies in these regions that will um, be able to do these sorts of treatments. And the, the hope is that that means less unnecessary demand on hospitals. Like they do now, pharmacists will be able to refer patients with more serious conditions or things they can't help with to their GP. But Mark says it's likely a lot more people with minor issues who go to the pharmacy will be able to get the care they need. So the hope is just that you actually take some of the pressure off of GPs by referring those minor issues to pharmacies where you can, um, because GPs are also going to be dealing with some of the stuff that doesn't really need to be going to hospital but can't go down to pharmacies. So again, it's that sloshing the demand back and forth kind of thing. Whether there's enough slack in the system overall, we'll have to find out. Yeah, well, that's the thing, sloshing the demand all around. Um, Is this just doing that without addressing the root problem here, which is a shortage of doctors, nurses and other staff in the health sector? Yeah, that's definitely the criticism of the plan that has been laid by certainly the the opposition. Some of the points I'd agree with, but the big question is, where's the workforce? Who's going to do it? Government has kind of done everything they can to bring in uh, doctors and nurses and other health professionals from overseas. So uh, they... You know, the, the the immigration pathway is wide open at the moment. That may help in the short term, but the evidence suggests that immigrant nurses and doctors tend not to stay in New Zealand for long. A lot of them leave pretty quickly after uh, one year, and, and the majority of them are gone after five. And so there's another element, which is much longer term one, of building a, a domestic training pipeline for, you know, New Zealand doctors, New Zealand nurses, other New Zealand health professionals. The problem being just that that takes time. You know, it's not something you can do overnight. It's not something you could do even a couple of years. And so in terms of preparing for this winter, the government's hands are somewhat tied. They've kind of done everything they can on increasing workforce capacity now, even if it may have been a bit of a belated move. And and now they're just, I guess, trying to do whatever they can around the edges to to make the whole thing work. You know, you'll notice that the criticism of the plan hasn't been that there's anything particularly wrong with it, um, just that people aren't sure that it will actually work or or be enough. What do you think we've learned from last year? I I think we have learned lessons from last year, and and, and part of that is what's informed the winter plan. And to some extent, the the benefits of this plan will will go on um, for some time. You know, there's a a big shift in the plan, for example, to telehealth, so allowing people, um, in some cases for free, to talk to their GP for a consult um, on issues that can be treated over, over, you know, uh, Zoom or or whatever other service uh, that they use. And the hope is, you know, it's not just a winter thing. It actually, as we go forward, it's a new way of doing healthcare, and, and it's kind of some of the stuff that having this big centralized health system instead of the 20 DHBs unlocks for us is the ability for the government to kind of play a more direct role in how healthcare is delivered in New Zealand. Um, and, you know, the health minister, Aisha Viral, is herself a, a former DHB doctor and a DHB board member. She's an infectious diseases physician. You know, she's been on that front line. And so she has a lot of um, ideas of how to make the system better or what she thinks will make the system better. And, you know, this is her opportunity to really kind of directly exert that influence on the health system. And so, you know, I think it, to, to sum that up, even if the plan doesn't reduce the, the pressure over winter by all that much, it doesn't mean it's a failure because it will, you know, the ideas in it are often pretty transparently common sense. You know, why have someone spend 70 bucks to go to the GP to get some skin cream for eczema when they could go to the pharmacy and get it for free? You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. And so opening up those pathways, making it easier for people to get care, making it more affordable for people to get care, um, making it closer to to where they live. You know, all of that is something that we want to see going forward in the health system, not just over winter. The other part of the the systemic issue, I guess, that we haven't really talked about is that increase in demand for health care. And so, you know, in the past, you'd, you'd kind of have not a lot of demand over summer. You'd get to winter, there would be a big spike, and then it would come back down again. But the pattern we've seen over the past few years is actually 
um, when you get to winter, there's a spike. It comes down a little bit, but not quite as low as it was before. And then the next year, it starts from a higher baseline. And so there's a kind of continually rising demand for health services, which means that even if we create a health system that meets all the demand we have this year, we're going to have higher demand next year. And so you, it's a constant process of ratcheting up to deal with higher demand. And, and the reasons for that higher demand aren't fully clear. You know, it's, it's a mixture of people's medical issues are a lot more complex than they used to be. The population is older. And so, uh, you know, more likely to be prone to, to needing hospitalization or something like that. And there's sort of pandemic-related effects, which include both, you know, we deferred a lot of planned care during the lockdowns and, and during periods of high stress in the health system, and that can come back to bite us and people who may have missed cancer scans or, or other issues because uh, of those deferrals. But also, you know, there's a, a lot of science showing that people who get COVID are much more likely to experience um, heart attacks and respiratory issues and, and a whole range of issues, including you know brain disease and Alzheimer's in the, the months and years after that infection than if they hadn't been infected. And so when you consider that about half the country at least has had COVID over the past year, we expect that that will mean some COVID-related but not acute COVID demand will start to appear. But what can we do as individuals to protect ourselves from getting sick this winter and ultimately ease the burden on the health system. Here's Emily Harvey again. Number one I say would say is making the envi indoor environments we're in safer. So that is ventilation and that means that when people go to school and work or socialising, they don't catch these viruses from, from other people there who might be unwell and not know. Number two, for COVID and for flu anyway, vaccination is so helpful. The more people who can go out and get those vaccines if they're eligible, the better. It'll reduce the strain on hospitals and it'll also uh, reduce the spread of the disease, especially for influenza. Number three, uh, support people to stay home when sick. And the modelling in the past years for influenza clearly shows that if you can get have a sick worker stay home rather than coming to work, you'll end up with fewer disruptions in your workplace. That's it for today. I'm Tom Kitchen. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today's episode was engineered by William Saunders. Our producers are Sarah Robson and Bonnie Harrison. Thanks to Mark Dalda, Michael Plank and Emily Harvey. Ma te wa.